Welcome, everybody, again this morning to church. Those of you watching online, it's great to be with all of you this morning. If you got your Bible, open it up. Uh, we're in the middle of a series, second week of, we're calling it T-I-O-N, uh, and we're just looking at some words that I believe that if you don't handle these words well, then they, it'll be a problem for you, but if you handle them well, then it'll be uh, a stepping stone for you into a new season of your life. Because sometimes we get stuck in seasons and we feel like, man, I feel like I've been in winter for five years. But last week I told you the word was rejection and, and a spirit or, or, of rejection. And you kind of fall down in this deep hole of rejection because either a spouse that you didn't think would ever leave you left you or a friend that you thought would always be there stabbed you in the back or something like that. But Jesus said betrayal is inevitable, which is horrible. I know that wasn't very encouraging last week. Betrayal is inevitable, but the reality is from the front of your book to the back of the Bible, there's people that went through lots of betrayal and lots of hardships, but, but those people that went through it, they were better on the other side of it, and they just refused for people to take their joy. Don't give anybody the power of taking your joy. Come on, they may betray you, say, you may have done this, but you will not take my joy because the joy of the Lord is my strength and I need my strength. And don't let anybody get you off mission because sometimes things happen, people betray you, people leave you. And, and if, you're, if you aren't careful, it'll leave you with a limp and the Lord's wanting you to run. But because that part wounded you, then you, uh, you can't run. You end up limping through life because of what the Bible says is a root of bitterness that can get in your heart and affect all these parts of your life. So last week was rejection. How, did, how do you handle rejection? And whenever people do betray you and things happen, I know pastor in the church, it can be uh, we've had people and everybody, you have these things that, that happen and it's just really tough, but you can't get stuck there. So how do you handle rejection? This week, I want to ask you, how do you handle correction? So whenever you're corrected, do you receive correction or are you easily offended? We're living in a time in society where everybody's offended about everything, it seems like. And no doubt there are people that, that they should be offended because offenses happen to people, that everything doesn't work out well. But uh, whenever you need to be corrected, uh, sometimes we want to leave the relationship and correction can kill relationships because you take it or perceive it the wrong way. Marriages can end just because there's a lack lack of ability to communicate correction one to another. Husband's working all day long. He comes home, he's tired, and the wife lays into him about all the stuff he's not doing right, right? Or vice versa, you know, the woman's taking care of the kids and taking care of this and trying to manage the bills and all that. And the husband always sees, he doesn't see what's right. He always sees what's wrong. And because, and there may be some correction that needs to be given there, right? Because we all need correction. But if you go about it the wrong way. How many of y'all know you can, uh, you can be right and still be wrong at the same time? Come on, the way you give correction, it may be right, but you're giving it wrong. Whenever you're disciplining your kids, it may be right, but it may be wrong at the same time. And wedges get put into relationships, into churches, dissension, and all this type of stuff. And God says you got to be on guard and watch out for these things. So whenever you're corrected, how well do you take it? Let, let's, let's ask like this, and I gave it to you in your worship guide. If you don't have a worship guide, you can... Uh, Raise your hand. We'll make sure that you have one. Uh, your future depends on your ability to be corrected. Your future depends upon your ability to be corrected. Because how many of you have experienced the correction of the Lord? Come on, and there's lots of ways the Lord will correct you. The Lord will correct you through a message like today, right, or any other message. You may be listening to some preacher on, on your car, on your commute, and the Lord using that ministry gift right then, he brings some correction about unforgiveness or not being merciful or whatever. The Lord's always bringing us correction, and our future is dependent upon what we do with the correction of the Lord. Come on, there's lots of times I preach and people walk up to me and they say, how do you know what I did? I'm like, I didn't know what you did. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just preaching up here. The Lord knows what you did. He's trying to bring the correction and your future is dependent upon the, whether or not you receive that correction, right? In marriages, marriages are dependent upon uh, the correction that comes. My wife and I, early on in our marriage, we split up for about six months. She moved to Baton Rouge. I stayed in Alexandria because I thought that I was God's gift to her for a husband. 
right? I could do no wrong. I'm the greatest man on the planet, and you should be lucky to share some breath space with me, right? Little did I know I was a pretty crappy husband. So I had to take that medicine. I had to take that correction. And, and what, what 18 years ago would have been the end of our marriage, uh, we took some correction, got some good counsel. But it's not the counsel that you get. It's the counsel that you do. Right? So the Bible says that you can be a hearer of the word, but if you don't do the word, then it doesn't do any good. So you getting correction doesn't really matter. But what we found people, some mentors, uh, mentors that we, uh, they had what we want. And all of you need somebody in your life who is a mentor to you that has what you want and that you don't just hear their advice, but you actually take their advice and you apply it to your life. So we read for, I read four or five books on marriage and started putting back together that relationship, but that thing could have died right there, right? It could have been, it could have just ended right there, but correction came and thank God for his correction. And nobody likes correction. Nobody likes to get their, their britches dusted off I mean how your daddy ever dusted your britches off right with a belt right? it's like why don't you use your hand right or, he, or your, how many of y'all ever had to go pick out your own switch right go pick out a switch yeah, listen I'm just telling you if you're a young person be really mindful about which one you pick <laughs> because you may want to swat it on your leg a little bit and figure out mm, that's not so bad pick that one pick that one right so nobody likes correction. Nobody likes getting, getting these things done to them, but they're, they're there because God wants you to grow. And whenever you get stuck in the pit of rejection, it kind of gives you a limp and you can't run. But whenever you get stuck and you refuse to, to be corrected, you refuse to grow. And that's really what correction is about, is it becomes a point where God's wanting you to go forward. But if you refuse that correction, he says, okay, then you'll just have to stay here. And you're like, well, man, why isn't the season changing? The scenery of my life hasn't changed the past 15 years. Well, it's possible that he's been dealing with you for 15 years about something that needs to be corrected. But because you're refusing the correction, you really can't go any further in certain areas of your life. So I want to help you deal with rejection. And I hope none of you are feeling rejected. And if you do, Jesus, you're, you know, Judas rejected him. There's a lot of people in the Bible and you can get over that. But also if there's correction that needs to come to you, receive that correction because it's not a bad thing, even though nobody's going to run around the church this morning with, with tambourines talking about how amazing this sermon is because nobody really enjoys talking about these things. But if you look in, and we'll just start here, Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 5. He says, Have you forgotten his encouraging words spoken to you as his children? Paul's asking him, he says, Have you forgotten what God has spoke to his kids? My children, don't estim underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord. And don't get depressed when he has to correct you. For the training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. How many of your parents ever said this is going to hurt me before more than it hurts you? Isn't that a lie from the pit of hell? They've never relinquished the belt to you, have they? And said, well, let's turn it around. Let's, no, they don't do that, right? But here he says, he says that there is correction that comes. But he actually says it's evidence of God's love. He loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. He cares about your future too much. And he cares about the people that you're going to influence too much for you to stay in that condition. It says, and when he draws you to himself, it proves that you are his delightful child. Fully embrace God's correction as part of your training. He's doing what any loving father does for his children. For who has ever heard of a child who had never had to be corrected? We all should welcome God's discipline as the validation of authentic sonship. In other words, you think you're a son. You're not a son if you don't accept his correction. You're just playing church. And you're trying to get into heaven. But he says, if you don't receive his Authentic sonship is just saying, Lord, if there's anything in me 
that needs to be fixed. I want to come before you with clean hands and a pure heart. Show me what needs to be corrected. He says, hey, that's authentic sonship. For if we never once endured his correction, it only proves that we're strangers and not sons. And isn't it true that we respect our earthly fathers even though they corrected and disciplined us? Then we should demonstrate an even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as we submit to his life-giving discipline. Our parents corrected us for a short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them, but God corrects us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share his holiness. All discipline seems to be more pain than pleasure at the time, yet later it will produce a transformation of character, bringing a harvest. So he says transformation, but he's also there's a harvest. There's a reward there of righteousness and peace to those who yield to it. Everybody say yield. Now, in harvesting terms, harvest, you can yield a good harvest. But here it says, hey, if you don't yield to correction, you won't yield a harvest. So if you want a better harvest, then yield to some correction. And how many of y'all know correction comes a lot of ways? Like it comes through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. It comes through uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will just kind of rub you down on the inside whenever you're about to do something that you shouldn't do, right? We've all experienced that. It can come through a peer. It can come through a friend. It can come through a family member. It can come through a spouse, I mean, I know we don't like those as much. Like, we'll take correction from other people more than we sometimes like to take it from those that are closest to us, right? It's like, I don't want to hear it from my mom. I don't want to hear it from my dad, right? Because I know everything, right? It's like, I'm a genius and you're not, right? So, but, but the Lord puts these people in our life not just to give us what we want and to make us happy. The Lord actually puts people in my life. The Lord put somebody in my life that took one of my ribs because my ribs cover my vitals. And my ribs cover the part of me that I can't see. So the Lord gave me somebody that can cover my vitals and that can see things that I can't see. And their job, her job, one of her jobs is to protect me and to help me. But sometimes I can resist that because it sounds like it's what I don't want to hear when it's really the voice of God who put somebody in my life to protect the parts of me that I can't see. So all of us have these different people in our life. Sometimes it's even, it's even an unbeliever. Sometimes it's even somebody that may be a boss that, that's not even saved. Isn't that horrible? If you look at Moses in the Old Testament, he had a father-in-law named Jethro. And Jethro didn't even uh, didn't, didn't serve the same God as Moses. Jethro was actually a priest of the Druze religion, and they believe in reincarnation. Like, right, you die and you come back as a giraffe or a butterfly or whatever. This was his father-in-law, but there came a point in his life where Moses wasn't doing things that was going to, in the long run, be good for him. So Jethro had to come to him and say, Listen, Moses, you married my daughter, and you're raising my grandkids, but what you're doing here is not good, and if you keep going down this path, you're going to wear yourself out, you're going to wear your marriage out, you're going to wear your kids out, you're going to wear your people out, and you're going to wear your own body, your own health out. You need to make some adjustments. And thank God Moses didn't get offended and be like, well, you're my father-in-law. This is my house. No, no, no. And, and he didn't even believe. This guy believed in reincarnation, very different than Moses, what Moses believed, you know, about Jehovah. But the Bible says that Moses heeded the correction of Jethro, and he did all that Jethro said to do. And because of doing that, he wound up doing exactly what God wanted him to do the rest of his life because he took correction from somebody that didn't necessarily believe what he believed, but there was something on the inside of Moses that said, you better listen to him because I've sent him to help you in this area. So why is this important? Well, let's look at some things. And, and, and uh, there's been times in my life where I've gotten uh, corrected because I deserved it. And other times I got corrected because I didn't deserve it. I asked Ansley this morning, I was like, uh, what's one time that you got in trouble by us that uh, you didn't deserve it? Boy, and it didn't take her long to come up with one. I mean, it wasn't two seconds. And she says, mom, 
You weren't in there, I don't think. She says, Mom took my phone away because Noble was laying on the bed and Noble was saying, what was she saying? Yeah, Noble kept like, was laying on the bed going, stop, Ansley, stop, Ansley. But she says, I wasn't even on the bed. I was laying on the floor. M- Noble was lying, saying that I was messing with him, and I got in trouble, and Mom took away my phone. And then Noble's laughing at the story. He's like, hee, hee, hee. Right, he thought it was so funny because he got her in trouble, right? And Ansley's still carrying this seed of unforgiveness. So that's a whole nother, a whole nother message that we're going to have to deal with Ansley about this root of bitterness that's producing bitter fruit in her life. It's really bad. But, but she, she got in trouble and got corrected and she really didn't do anything. And my, my previous place that I worked, we were children's pastors for, I guess, uh, maybe 11 years or so. And uh, we do career Sundays. We still do them here. Well, we'll bring people that are go to church here. And if you're a draftsman or if you're a police officer or whatever, you go in children's church and you tell the kids about what you do. You say, hey, I'm an engineer. This is what I do. And they bring some props and all that stuff. And the reason that we started doing this 20 years ago is we noticed that whenever you ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most of them said the same thing, like I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, because that's just what they've heard. But they really didn't know any other jobs that were out there except maybe what their parents did. So we would bring a banker in, we bring different people in, so that whenever the kids said, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? They actually had, uh, by the end of the year, they had 12 job descriptions in their brain of things that they would maybe like to be. And then whoever was doing Career Sunday, they would tie it into a biblical... yeah, how God helps you do what you do or whatever. So anyway, so we had this police officer come in and he's a, he was a big time detective, very successful detective. And he came in and said, hey, every, hey, boys and girls, I'm detective so-and-so. And uh, he put on these beer goggles on. How many of you ever put the beer goggles on before? And they are, they, these police officers, they give you these goggles because they simulate what it's like to drink and drive. And they handcuff the kids and put some of the kids in the back of the car, right? And the kids are loving it. And by the end of it, they're like, I want to be a police officer. And, you know, and he's really talked it up. And then he says, all right, well, I have a video presentation. I want to show y'all. This is us. We're about to raid a house. These people are known drug dealers. So we're going to rip the metal gate off of the front of their house. We're going to breach the front door and we're going to go in and arrest these people. And I'm sitting there like, yes, this is going to be awesome. And the kids are like, yes, this is going to be awesome. So all of a sudden you see them hook this thing up and you hear, and they rip the metal door. You know, they had bars on the front and then they ram the door and then about eight officers go in there and let out about 5,000 cuss words. Loud, nasty cuss words. Get down on the ground, blankety blank, 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 you nothing blank. And then the other guy that's getting arrested, he's giving it back to the cops. He's like, you blankety blank, and you hear, rrr, rrr, and then I mean, it's just nasty. And I'm sitting there, and all the blood goes out of my body. There's about 155, like six to 11 year olds, and all the blood goes out of all the little children's bodies. And we've all got heavy feet now. And Elizabeth looks at me and she's like, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. We just, we just gave a whole education on expletives to our children's church Sunday school class. This is going to go over really well. So needless to say, correction was coming. Right? And we got called in. How many of you ever got called in before? We got called in, Right? And uh, it, it was a bad calling in. And we could have, you know, thank God we didn't get fired. And, uh, and, and we could have quit, you know, and people quit over lesser things. But we needed the correction, right? Because we screwed up. How many of y'all know there's one thing we never have done again, which is not pre screen the video, <laughs> right? Because that was the first question. Why didn't you watch it before? Do you know what? an assumption does for you, and that's a whole nother thing, right? I don't want to go there. Uh, Inspect what you expect, right? Another time, we had this big, huge fountain in the foyer of the church, and it was my job to, whenever it would evaporate, I would fill the fountain back up. This is part of my job description because I also was head of maintenance. And about 6.30 or 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning, the phone rang, and whenever I answered the phone, I realized... 
I had left the fountain running in the church. And this is another moment when all the blood, for some reason, it just leaves this part of me. And my fingers got really tingly because I knew that the water hose had been left on in the church all night long. And the sanctuary was flooded, and the whole fountain foyer was <laughs> flooded. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and the bookstore was flooded, and all the books were curled up. Like, you couldn't even see, like, the title. You had to unroll it to look at the title, and then whenever you would let go, it would roll back up. And I remember standing there, and church was starting, you know, at, like, 9, and this is at, like, 7 o'clock in the morning. And I got called in again. <laughs> Believe it or not, I got called in again. And the correction came, right? And there were maybe times even during that correction, I thought, well, that's not very Christ-like. <laughs> well, that's not, I'm not sure that scripture's in the Bible right there. How dare thee speak of thee in such a way as thee, right? And that's just a couple, right? And through, through our journey and through our life, uh, we've had lots of correction. A lot of the correction that I get is, is from my wife. But let me say this, I've given my wife permission to correct me, and I've given other people permission to correct me. So if your future depends on how you take correction, who have you given in your life permission to correct you? Is there anybody in your life that you've said, if I'm out of line, correct me? And I'm not going to jump all over you, but I don't want to get stuck here. I want to go forward. And I want you to be a voice in my life that gives correction. Is it a mentor? A mentor is a prophecy of your future. A mentor is just somebody that you say, I want what you've got. I want what you've learned. A parasite wants what you've earned, but a protege wants what you've learned. So you, to be a protege and just say, hey, I don't just want what you've earned. I want what you've learned. And if there's anything in me that you're seeing that's not right, I'll receive that correction because I don't want to get stuck here. And if you look at Jesus, Jesus said something really similar here in Matthew. Matthew, the, uh, I'm sorry, I lied. John chapter 15. It's not Matthew, it's John. John chapter 15. Jesus, red letters, uh, he says, I'm the real vine, my father's the farmer. And he cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape bearing, he prunes it back so it will bear even more. So he says, even what's working, God will still trim on that so it'll work better. And what's not working, God will totally take it out of your life. And the correction of the Lord, whether it's coming through preaching, teaching. How many of you have ever opened up your Bible before just for it to turn into a sword and start cutting on you? And you're like, Lord, I am not ready for this. I have not had my coffee yet. I just sat down. I just sat down to do my devotion. And you've already got the sword of the Spirit out, which is the Word of God. And you're slicing and dicing me and my heart right now. What is that? Well, that's the correction of the Lord. Why does he do that? Well, Jesus said, he said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And the branches of your life is, what, is where the fruit is. And God won't just take what's working and leave it alone. He'll actually keep working at it so that it produces more. And the things in your life that need to be removed, he says, if you'll allow him, he'll take it off. And how many of y'all know sometimes it's painful? How many of y'all have ever been cut on before? Come on, if trees could talk. Come on, I just got out there and with my hedge trimmer a couple days ago, right? I'm thinking about this message, and I just go to work, right? And I'm trimming them, and I'm sure that the, the, little, the little bushes would have something to say about all of my trimming as I take all the clippings, and I bring it over to the side of my house, and I set it on fire. And that's, very, that's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, hey, he cuts all these things off, and then they're burned. He gets rid of them. Why? He tells you. He says, so that it'll bear more grapes. It'll be more fruitful. Because fruitfulness is harvest, there's more productivity, and there's more resources that become available. So if you ever get stuck in your resources or in your finances or just in your talent or whatever, God says, hey, I'm a husbandman, which is an interesting name there. 
He actually says God is a husbandman. He is somebody there. He's a vine dresser. In other words, if you, we went to Napa Valley this year and, and uh, we were going from L.A. to San Francisco, so we stopped and spent the night, and I've never been around vineyards or anything like that. But the whole time we're there, there's people out in the field. Every day they go out there and they're checking on these vines, and they're trimming and they're cutting away. And some of these vines are 30 or 40 years old, and they're st- they, still, they still need pruning, I mean, I know you don't just need pruning when you're 16. Come on, you don't just need pruning whenever you're 11. No, if you look at Jethro, Moses worked for Jethro four decades before this correction came. Moses is an old man. Moses is standing before Pharaoh. I mean, Moses, Moses could have been like, have you seen the beard? Have you seen the Ten Commandments? And yet you're correcting me. But the Bible says he heeded his instruction. And he says he did all that he was told to do. Why? Because Moses didn't want to get stuck there. And whenever we start refusing, when we get stuck in the hole of rejection, we get a limp. And whenever we refuse correction, we just stop growing. But it says here, Jesus is really, really clear. He says, you are pruned by the message that I've spoken. So the Lord speaks messages to our hearts. What for? To prune us. And we don't, may not like it. There may be seasons of your life. There's seasons of my life where the Lord will prune television out of my life. Just totally out of it. Like I may go two months, he'll just say, unplug the cable or unplug the television. There may be seasons where he may want to prune social media out of your life. In fact, next week is another T-I-O-N, which you don't want to miss. It's going to be really great. But there's certain things that the Lord may cut out of your life. Not forever. But how many of y'all know whenever you're fasting, you're cutting food out of your life for a period of time? Because have you noticed food can be loud? Loud! It's like it's the loudest thing you hear. Right? How many of y'all smelled gumbo recently? Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for cold weather. Good sausage. A dark roux. A dead chicken. Thank you, Lord, so much. Right? Food can be loud, so the Lord will prune that. The Lord will prune your money. Why? Jesus says, when you give, don't give like this. Give like that. And a lot of times we hold on to that. We don't want him pruning that part. No, no, no. Why? He, he says, I don't want you to get covetous. I don't want you to have faith in, in, in other people. I don't want you to have faith in the economy. He says, give me this and I'll bless this more and you'll have more. Well, that's a step of faith. He says, when you fast, don't fast like this. Fast like that. He says, when you pray, don't pray like this with standing up on a box and so everybody can see how spiritual you are. No, no, no. Pray like this. Go into your closet and he'll take you into that closet and he'll prune on you. And he says the reason he does that is so that you're more fruitful. The reason he does that is so that you're better. And rather than getting bitter, you can get better. And sometimes when correction comes, we want to get bitter. You know, I used to work for this guy that was, he was a Christian and he was a pastor, but he wasn't very nice. I mean, y'all know that there are some Christians who pastor and they aren't very nice. In fact, they're mean as hornets and you want to stab them in the eyeball. He was one of these people to me, uh, but I had to work for him, and I wanted to quit, but the Lord wouldn't let me quit. And every day I'd wake up and sit on the edge of my bed, and i think, I'm totally quitting. This is horrible. I could make more as one of those people that check your receipt at Sam's. I would be in the air condition, and people would smile. But I got to work for this guy. And my job was I would clean up job sites. So whenever they would leave at 3 o'clock, I would come in. And from 3 to 5, I would sweep the job site where they're building houses. And I would put everything, sweep it all up in the dustpan and dump it. And I would clean up the the pieces whenever they would lay bricks. My job was to clean everything up. And there was more than one occasion whenever I would sweep a whole room. And then I would go to be dumping it. And one of the nails would fall out of the dustpan and would fall on the ground. And I would dump the dustpan in the trash and I would walk to the next room and the Lord would say, you dropped something. Really, Jesus? You saw that? Nobody else saw it and it's going to be okay. He said, no, no, no. You dropped a nail. You left a nail in the floor in there. And I knew it was the Lord because I knew it wasn't the devil telling me to go pick up this nail, right? And it wasn't my own mind because I wanted to go home. So I knew just instinctively the Lord is trying to prune something out of me, which was my distaste for him, number one, and that nobody was watching or whatever. So anyway, so I would have to go back and I would have to throw that away. And that happened many times. And what is that? That's just the pruning of the Lord. And watch this, because if you look in 
Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, verse number 30. Remember, Jesus is talking about a vineyard and, and God pruning some things out of your life. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 24. The writer here, he says, One day I walked by a field of an old lazy bones, and I passed the vineyard of a lute. And the vineyard was overgrown with weeds. It was thick with thistles, and its fences were broken down. And I took a long look, and I pondered at what I saw. And the fields preached a sermon, and I listened. He said, I see this field. I see this vineyard. The walls are broken down. It's overgrown. It hasn't been kept. There hasn't been a vine dresser allowed on the property to clean it up. There hasn't been a husbandman allowed in there to clean it up. So this field that started preaching a sermon... And I listened. If I say, listen, come on, it's not the information you get, it's what you do with it. So he says, I listened and I heard a nap here and a nap there, a day off here and a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do what you do. Do you know what comes next? Just this. You can look forward to a dirt poor life with poverty as your permanent house guest. So whenever we refuse correction, it's pretty clear. Our life gets overrun with thistles and weeds. Things get broken down in our life. We need the correction of the Lord. That's one of the reasons why, why, why people leave churches and they leave ministries and they'll leave the Lord is because the devil likes to keep you out of his presence. Because in his presence, number one, there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. But there's also a pruning and a correction that comes from the Lord. So that at the end of your life, you have fruit that remains. Instead of just a broken down, fenced out, fenceless vineyard that just has nothing in it. That's why, that's why we have and we need the correction of the Lord. We need it bad. If you look, this is a, an interesting story in the Old Testament. And I'll close with this. I lied. I'm not closing with this. I've got like three other points. So you just sit there, I guess. and Just sit there. We ain't done yet. But in Numbers chapter 22, there's another vineyard. There's something about these vineyards, and you are the vineyard. You're the vineyard, and God, he will do these things to us, and we don't always like them. But there's a guy in the Old Testament, and this is in Numbers chapter 22, and his name's Balaam. And Balaam is going to go and pronounce a curse on these people. But God told Balaam, he says, you don't go down there and do that. And then he gave him permission to go. But watch this. It says, Balaam got up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He went off with the nobleman from Moab. And as he was going, God's anger flared. And an angel of God stood in the road to block his way. And Balaam was riding his donkey, accompanied by his two servants. And when the donkey saw the angel blocking the road and brandishing a sword, she, the donkey, veered off the road into the ditch. And Balaam beat the donkey to get her back on the road. So Balaam is wanting to go somewhere. He's wanting to go do something. He's got something in his mind he's wanting to accomplish. But God doesn't want him to do it. So God put an angel in front of him to block him there. But he is riding a donkey. And the donkey has better spiritual perception than he does. Right? The donkey's seeing better than him. So... I won't go there. Who's the jackass in the story? Because it can't be the donkey. Because the donkey's seeing better than he is. Balaam beat the donkey to get her back on the road. Why? Because sometimes correction's coming to us, but we want to turn that thing around. But as they were going through a vineyard, with a fence on either side, the donkey again saw God's angel blocking the way and veered into the fence, crushing Balaam's foot against the fence. So Balaam hit her again. 
And God's angel blocked the way yet again, a very narrow passage this time. And there was no getting through on the right or the left. Seeing the angel, Balaam's donkey sat down under him. He just sat down. Balaam lost his temper and he beat the donkey with his stick. And God's angel said to him, why have you beaten your poor donkey these three times? I've come here to block your way. Because you're getting way ahead of yourself. The donkey saw me and turned away from these three times. And if she hadn't, I would have killed you by now, but not the donkey. I would have let her off. And then God gave speech to the donkey. And the donkey said to Balaam, what have I ever done to you that you would beat me these three times? And Balaam said, because you've been playing games with me. If I had a sword, I would have killed you by now. He's still really resistant, even though he's talking to a donkey. In God about angels. I mean, I know sometimes we really resist the correction of the Lord, and he's trying to get us back on track. Come on, I'm just speaking from experience. The Lord's tried to get me back on track many times, and I have fought tooth and nail. And this guy's fighting tooth and nail. So the, the donkey says, am I not your trusty donkey on whom you've ridden for years up until now? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Have I? And he said, no. And then God helped Balaam see what was going on. Come on, and that's my prayer for you today, is that if, you, if the Lord's been correcting you about something, whether it's about a relationship or a direction or something going on in your life, unforgiveness, that God is trying to give you a word, and the last word was rejection, and this week's correction, so that you won't get stuck in this season of your life of unfruitfulness, and so that you won't uh, let your vineyard get run over by weeds, Come on, this is my prayer, is that you see, that God help you see what's going on. And, and he saw God's angel blocking the way, brandishing a sword. And watch this, here comes the repentance. Balaam fell to the ground, his face in the dirt. That's tough, that's hard to do. But come on, whenever you're wrong, sometimes it's just good to say you're wrong. Come on, there's been times I've had to tell my kids, hey, I, I, I punished you. I, I, what I did was right, but I did it the wrong way. So I got to put my face in the dirt, and I need you to forgive me. Right? I need you. I need correction from you. Balaam said to God's angel, "Angel, I've sinned. I have no idea that you were standing in the road blocking my way. If you don't like what I'm doing, I'll head back." So you got another vineyard here, and this guy, he's God's trying to get him somewhere. I mean, I remember in the, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he thought that he was doing what God wanted him to do, didn't he? He's out here serving the Lord, man. He is really going for, but he was not doing what the Lord wanted him to do. And the Bible says finally that the Lord knocked him off his high horse. He's riding a high horse, a light shone down from heaven. He falls off, he's blinded, and, and, and a voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, a goad was just a sharp stick that whenever uh, you were behind some oxen and the oxen was plowing, you're beating the oxen because he's not going fast enough or whatever. And, and the ox would get mad at you beating him. So he would try to kick the person that's whipping him. But there was a sharp stick that was there so that whenever the oxen would kick back, he would hit that goad. And the, the, the Lord put a supernatural goad down on the inside of the Apostle Paul. And even though he says he's doing what the Lord wanted him to do, he was not a really a true son. Because God had put a goad there and he says, you keep kicking against this goad. There's a rod of correction that's sticking there and you keep just kicking on it. You won't listen to me, but there's lives at stake. Somebody's got to write Colossians and Philippians and Ephesians. Somebody's got to write First and Second Thessalonians. Somebody's got to write First and Second Timothy. You've got to get on the right road. And if you won't listen to the goat, if you won't listen to the angel, I'll show up myself to correct you so that you can be fruitful and you don't waste your life being unfruitful. So we just got to say, hey, man, Lord, for, Lord, for me, that's what repentance is really about. Repentance is just moments in your life where you say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, and I'll change. I'll repent. I'll turn and go another direction. And that's not always fun. We don't always want to do that. But there's ways that you can do it well. So in the last part of your worship, God, I want you to write, how do you give correction? Because you got to be able to take correction. If you flood the fountain foyer or if you expose children to a bunch of expletives. 
right? If you've said bad things to your kids and whipped them out of anger instead of out of love, right? And there's, there's these things that happen in your life. So you have to receive the correction from your devotional, from the preaching of the word, from the Holy Spirit, from your friend. Uh, and, and you should have people in your life, I'm going to say this again, that, that they can uh, be accountable to you. I'll never forget as a 25-year-old guy, me and another guy were about to cut the grass at the church. I'm working at the church. This guy's volunteering at the church. And he says, hey, I need your help. I said, okay. And I'm thinking, all right, we're going to, he needs help doing some mowing or something here at the church. He says, I've been struggling with pornography and I want you to know about it. And I want you to ask me every couple of days how I'm doing. And I'll always be honest with you and I'll tell you where I'm at because I need your help with this. Why? Well, he was being overtaken by weeds and he knew if he didn't get a, if he didn't, if he didn't have a husband and somebody there that was, he was accountable to, then it was going to, it was going to stunt his productivity. Thank God he was smart enough and had the, the bravery enough to say, I need somebody in my life that'll hold my feet to the fire in this area of my life. So, of course, I agreed, agreed, and he went on, got married, and everything turned out, I guess, up to this point, fine, but I'm glad that he was willing to do that. So, do you have those people in your life? I'm just encouraging you, if, if correction comes, don't resist it because God loves you. That's why he's sending it. God wants to help you. So, we got we to gotta receive correction, but how do we give it? The two things I want you to just think about is lead with compassion, So if you're going to correct either your spouse or your kids or your subordinate, whoever it is, lead with compassion. Because the goal of correction is restoration. Sometimes we think that the goal of correction is punishment. But watch, if you you look at this in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1, he says, Live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin forgivingly restore. Everybody say restore. So the goal of correction is restoration. I mean, I remember whenever Jesus said, uh, hey, don't worry about the speck in somebody else's eye without at least considering the beam in your own eye. I mean, I remember that one. Here, same thing. He says, hey, if somebody needs correction, your job is to try to restore them. Save your critical comments for yourself. In other words, they don't need the criticism. They already knew they did wrong. They know they screwed up. Forgivingly restore them. Save the critical comments for yourself. You might be needing forgiveness before the day's out. Ouch. Cuts like a knife. You might need forgiveness before the day's out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed. Share their burdens. And so complete Christ's law. If you think you're too good for that, you're badly deceived. So we all need correction. He says, hey, whenever you give correction, do it with mercy. Remember what it's like to be a teenager. How many of y'all remember that? How many of y'all know it was hard? How many of y'all know those zits that get real deep? Right? Braces. How many of y'all remember braces? Come on, sometimes we forget what it's like to be a teenager and go to school and all that type of stuff. Remember what it's like to be single and all that type of stuff. Have compassion. Try to help them. And then the last one is lead with what's right. Sometimes we want to lead with what's wrong. We want to see what's wrong with people, and that's what we want to lead with. But tell me, I know in the last book of your Bible is a book called Revelations. And in Revelations chapter 2, Jesus is talking to seven different churches. And he is, he's getting on to them. And he's dusting their, 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 their hiney off. He's really getting on to them good. And he says, you, the church at Ephesus. And, but, but, but what I want you to see here, watch how Jesus does this. How many of y'all think we could learn a few things from Jesus? How many of y'all remember the disciples said, how many times we got to forgive? Seven times, that's bound to be enough. And God, Jesus said, no, 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 70 times seven. That's how many times. We could learn some things from Jesus. Watch what he says at, at Revelations. He's writing to a church and he's about to correct them. And he says, I see what you've done, your hard, hard work, your refusal to quit. And I know you can't stomach evil and that you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence. I know your courage in my cause. Well, that don't sound like correction, does it? That sounds pretty affirming. That's really nice. 
I know that you never wear out, but, everybody say but. He gives like five things that they're doing right before he says anything about what they're doing wrong. And if you look at all seven churches, he treats all seven of them the same way. Man, you're doing good. You're giving to the poor and you're preaching really good and we really like this. And, and, but I need you to fix this area right here. So whenever it comes to give correction, whether it's your kids or your wife or anything, come on, don't lead with what they're doing wrong. I thank God for my wife. It took her a while to figure this out. Uh, but... Uh, you know, whenever a man comes home from work, the first thing he don't need to hear is all the stuff he's doing wrong. He needs to come home and just be home for a minute, not get a laundry list of what's broken around the house. Well, this is broke. Well, this is broke. If he was a good man, then you would take care of this. No, that, no. My wife has learned that whenever it comes to correcting me, feed me a lot of food first. <laughs> Give me about four helpings of gumbo. Yeah, and then put my head in your lap and scratch my head. And then you can say whatever you want, and I'll receive that correction. As long as you don't stop scratching, I'm good. Like, it's like, you can't talk to Ansley like that. You can't tell girls that. Okay. You can't talk to husband Noble like that. You're being too harsh. It's the, the refrigerator's broken. I need you to fix it and pick up a part. And it's like, yes, ma'am. Whatever you need, darling, whatever you need. Can I do anything else for you? Can I tell you, you're a great wife. Is there anything else I'm doing wrong? Because I don't mind hearing it right now. Come on, wife. My wife will tell me, she says, you're a good pastor. You're a good preacher. You're a good dad. But. Well, I'm okay with that but because I've given her permission. Hey, if there's things in me that ain't right, tell me. If I'm doing things that ain't right, tell me. I need it. But, but come on, come on. for us with your kids, lead with what they're doing right, not with what they're doing wrong. Your employees, lead with what they're doing right. Say, man, you've been showing up early, but it's like you need to brush your teeth because <laughs> it ain't good, right? I once had, this is a friend of mine I graduated with, a pastor, a good friend of mine. We were walking into prayer. We're literally about to walk into prayer. And he's, he's opened the door and he's walking in and he turns around and I'm right behind him and he says, you chew with your mouth open sometimes, and it's gross. This is what he told me. No joke. We're going into prayer. And I thought, I'm going to pray for you not to die whenever I hit you in the nose. But he literally told me that as I'm walking into prayer. And he says, I'm telling you this because one day you're going to sit with important people, and you need this to be fixed. We graduated high school together. We're peers. You all know I never forgot that. And how many of you know whenever I'm eating, I'm conscious now of my mouth? And I'm giving all of you permission. If you ever see me smacking my food, please tell me. You eat me with your mouth open, and it's gross, right? But I'll never forget that. What was that? That's correction. And I could have ended that friendship and been like, well, your feet stink. <laughs> right? I could have come up with something, right? No, no, no. Come on, we need this. I need, I need help, right? Because I don't want my life to get overgrown. And, and if the Lord needs to trim some things out of my life, then trim away, whatever it takes. And whenever I go to correct my wife, my kids, my subordinates, my peers, come on, I got half a dozen other places that we could have looked. Then Peter tried to correct Jesus, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, the, all through the Bible, you see this common theme of correction. Why? Because God wants you to bear fruit and more fruit, and if there's anything in you that's, that's taken away from that fruit, he wants to cut it off. Why? So that your life can be on a trajectory that's going up instead of not even just going down, just going across. Because there's a lot of vineyards that are living that just aren't producing. Or they're making 1,000 barrels a year when they could make 2,000 barrels a year if they would just allow the husbandman to come in and do what he needs to do. All right, last one. This is really the last one. I'm not lying anymore, but I want to end in Proverbs because Proverbs has about 50 scriptures that have to do with this, but I couldn't give you all of them. So we'll just end with Proverbs chapter 15. Accepting constructive criticism opens your heart to the path of life. Accepting, not being so offended, easily offended. Hey, accept constructive criticism. It'll open your heart to the path of life. It'll make you right at home among the wise. Refusing constructive criticism shows you have no interest in improving your life. 
for revelation and insight. It only comes as you accept correction and the wisdom that it brings. The source of revelation knowledge is found as you fall down and surrender before the Lord. Don't expect to see the Shekinah glory until the Lord sees your sincere humility. And then that really what it's all about, refusing correction is just pride. I don't need blah, 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 blah. Yes, you do. David did. Even Jesus would bow before the Father and say, not my will, but your will. I'll do it. I'll do what you want me to do. And this is the path to life. And you'll be seen as wise. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Father God.